Hello, welcome to ORS 101. Today we'll be teaching you how to build a PC from scratch. The first thing you'll need is a large enough workspace. You'll need plenty of tools and components when building a PC, so a spacious, wide table will make it easier for being organized. If you want bonus points, having an anti-static mat on the table will be helpful as well. You will need several tools. Screwdrivers are essential to the PC building process. To make sure you won't screw up, a long-handled magnetic screwdriver will help you access difficult-to-reach spaces within the case, while also preventing screws from falling inside. You need one standard Phillips screwdriver and a small one. You may also find a pair of needle-nose pliers useful. Another thing you need to keep in mind is PC components are very vulnerable to static electricity. Make sure you have worn an anti-static strap on your wrist before touching any parts. The CPU is the heart of your whole PC setup. Without it, nothing can actually work. The mainstream CPU choices on the market right now are either Intel or AMD processors, and they use different motherboards. So remember to purchase the right motherboard for your CPU. Let's start with the Intel CPU. To install it, first take out your motherboard with care. Each motherboard has a socket for your CPU to be installed. There's a protective cover for your socket, so don't rush to remove it. Push the lever down to open the load plate and you'll see the CPU socket. There are many pins on the socket and you can check if those pins are bent or damaged before putting your CPU in. Then, carefully hold the CPU with your thumb and index finger, and now it's time to install it. For Intel CPUs, there are notches on the CPU and you can easily align those notches with those on the socket without extra pressure. Once the CPU is placed down, close the load plate down and push the lever to keep your CPU in place. You will need a little extra strength to push the lever. The protective cover will come off automatically. Don't throw away the protective cover. You will need this if you send the motherboard in for repair. As for AMD CPUs, first, lift up the lever. Second, hold the AMD CPU with extra care. You don't want to bend the pins on the back of the CPU. The AMD CPU has a golden triangle mark on it, and the way to install it is to align it with the triangle on the socket. Gently lower the CPU straight down into the socket. Finally, push down the lever. Now the heart of your PC is perfectly installed. Good job. If you want higher speeds for storage, then you'll need an SSD running PCIe protocol. Usually, this kind of SSD uses an M.2 connector, and the slots for it are hidden under the SSD shield on the motherboard. Unscrew the shield first, and you'll see the M.2 slot for it. Insert the SSD at a 30 degree angle and push it from the back. It should sit in a raised position. Put the screw on to lower down the SSD. Remove the protective film on the heatsink to give your SSD better cooling. Then, screw the shield on the motherboard. One thing to be noted is, while there may be more than one M.2 slot available on your motherboard, we recommend installing the SSD in the M.2 slot closest to the CPU. That way it won't be influenced by the heat generated by your graphics card. A CPU can get very hot once it starts to run. That's why we need a CPU cooler. The most traditional solution to CPU cooling is a tower CPU cooler. If you are using a custom third party rather than a stock cooler, you should carefully follow the manufacturer's installation guide. Generally, the first thing you need to do is install the backplate to secure the cooler in place. Check if your cooler comes with a pre-applied thermal paste. If so, you don't need to put any extra thermal paste on the CPU. If it doesn't, apply the thermal paste to the top lid, and the amount can't be too much or too less we recommend applying a drop of thermal paste on the center of the CPU. Third, the common mistake is installing the cooler with the sticker. So remember to remove the Remove Me sticker on the CPU cooler. To put the cooler in the correct direction, you might want to first read the manual. If you want to do it on your own, just make sure the airflow is coherent to that of the case. Once you are certain of the direction, put the screw on and connect the fan connector to the motherboard. And you're good to go. The next step is to install the RAM. First, open the clips on the end of each RAM slot and then align the notch on the RAM module with the ridge on the slot. After that, press the RAM down with both your thumbs until you hear a click sound. 
That means you've installed the RAM successfully. If you only have two memory sticks and want to activate the dual channel configuration, remember to read the manual of your motherboard and check which slot should be used. Generally, two and four sets can activate dual channel configuration. Sometimes there will also be instructions printed on the motherboard that will tell you which slots should be used. Now we are done with the motherboard, it's time to put it with the components installed in the case. Here we're using the case, the Aorus AC300W. Some motherboards come with discrete IO shields and some have the IO shield pre-mounted. If you get a discrete one, install the IO shield to fill up the cutout for the IO first. Otherwise, dust will easily get into your case and damage your component. Before putting the whole motherboard in, the first thing is to lay down your case for a better working angle. Install the motherboard standoff to keep the motherboard from directly contacting the case. Once it is done, put the motherboard into the case and make sure the direction is right by aligning the screw holes on the motherboard with the standoff and aligning the IO ports on your motherboard with the cutout for ports on the IO shield. Last, secure all screws on. Don't secure the screws too tight before you put all of them on. Despite using an M.2 SSD for system storage, if you need more storage for your games or other files, you can still expand your system storage by adding more SATA drive. Remove the hard drive mounting bracket on the back of the chassis and secure your SATA drive on it. Once the hard drive is put in place, remount the bracket to the chassis. Then, choose the shortest path to connect the drives to the motherboard with SATA cables. The SATA ports are on the right side of the motherboard. Each port has a number printed on the motherboard, or you can read your manual to check the number. Make sure you connect them by following the order from 0 to 6. Power supply unit, or PSU, is where your system gets its power from. We recommend you to use a modular PSU because it's easier to mount. Also, your PSU should supply at least 50 to 100 watts, more than your system needs. The PSU comes with many cables, but normally you don't need all of them. Therefore, it's important to know what components you'll use beforehand to determine what cables you'll need. It is recommended to use cables that come with your PSU that you purchase. Don't combine it with other cables, as it may damage your PC. Normally, you'll need a 24-pin power cable to supply electricity for the motherboard, two 8-pin power cables for the CPU, and if you have a dedicated graphics card, prepare another dual 8-pin cable for it. If you use a high-end graphics card that has two power supply sockets or more, it is recommended to use two PCIe power cables for it. You will also need a 6-pin to Molex connector power cable for your system fans and a SATA power cable for storage drives. Notice some cables have adjustable connectors to fit more sockets, so remember to insert the adjustable end to the sockets on your motherboard or components instead of those on the PSU. After all those cables are connected to the PSU, secure the PSU on the case. One easy way to install the PSU is by aligning the screw holes on it without those on the case. If you are not sure whether you got the direction right, remember to keep the fan at the bottom. Connect the 24 pins power to the right side of the motherboard. Connect the 8 pin power to the upper left side of the motherboard. And connect the system fans to your motherboard. Connect the Molex connector to your system fans Finally, connect the SATA cable to the storage drive. Now we're going to connect the case to the motherboard and connect important features such as power, reset switches, LED lights, as well as audio and USB ports. Connect the front audio on the bottom of the board. Connect the USB 2.0 or 3.0 ports. Connect the Type-C port if your case has one. If you can't find the corresponding connectors, double check the manual of the motherboard. Finally, use the G connector to manage the rest of the tiny cables. Line each cable to the appropriate slots on the G connector, then connect the G connector to the socket on the lower right side of the motherboard. The last thing to be installed into the chassis is the graphics card. It's recommended that you insert the graphics card in the PCIe x16 slot, which is the closest to the CPU. To install the graphics card, make sure that the motherboard is still powered off, then remove the corresponding I.O. plates. Generally, you need to remove two slots of I.O. plates. 
Carefully insert the card into the relevant PCIe slot. The graphics card should just fit on the motherboard if you install it correctly. Make sure the graphics card is secure, but try not to over tighten the screw. Finally, connect the PCIe dual 8-pin connector to your graphics card. Now we're gonna test whether the PC can run properly. Connect the power cables to the PSU and turn it on. Press the power button on the case. Some motherboards have a debug LCD code. You can check the corresponding code on the manual to see whether your computer is installed correctly. Some motherboards also have status LEDs. The CPU, DRAM, graphics card LED is on, that means the corresponding device is not working normally. Go check whether the power cable is connected tightly enough and the hardware is installed properly. If the CPU, VRAM, graphics card lights are all off, that means that you've correctly installed all the hardware. Good job. The most difficult and important step is cable management. Bad cable management can cause lots of problems, ranging from disrupting airflow within the case to hurting your hardware. Before you organize the cables, remember to disconnect the power. Good cable management is keeping the inside of the PC as tidy as possible. First, hide long cables to the back of the case. You should pull the cables gently or the connectors might get loose. Use zip ties to fix the cables to the case and the rest of the cables will go down to the bottom of the case. You can remove the hard drive tray if necessary. Check if all the cables are connected stably and put the back plate on. Before you turn on the PC, you'll need to connect a variety of devices such as the mouse and keyboard, as well as the monitor and audio device. First, connect the keyboard and mouse to the motherboard's USB ports. We recommend that you don't use the blue or red USB 3.0 port, as those ports are designed to be used with storage devices that can take advantage of the larger bandwidth and faster speeds. Second, connect the audio device on the front panel. You can use the essential USB DAC provided with the motherboard connector headset. This will greatly enhance the depth of your music. In view of audio speakers, follow the instruction manual supplied by the manufacturer. Generally speaking, the audio speakers will connect to the motherboard's line-out audio jack. Finally, connect the monitor to the graphics card HDMI port. Do not connect to the motherboard's HDMI port, as you will see nothing when you boot. After installing all of the hardware, it's time to install the operating system. Here we need a bootable USB drive, which you can easily make by following one of the instructions on the Microsoft website. Insert the USB drive to the USB 3.0 port and boot the PC. Your PC will detect the USB drive with the OS and start installing the operating system. If your PC doesn't start automatically installing the OS, on or some other boards, you can enter the BIOS setting by pressing Delete or F2 or F12 key on your keyboard immediately after you turn on your PC. Change the boot device priority to the USB drive with the OS, and then press F10 to save your settings and exit the BIOS. If you follow the previous step, you will see the installation interface on your screen. Just follow the steps and wait patiently for your system to be installed. We recommend installing your operating system on the SSD, and this will not only reduce the installation time, but also speed up your boot time considerably. After installing the OS, make sure you have already connected to the internet and go to the service.ors.com website to install the latest drivers according to which hardware you have. You can also start downloading games simultaneously. Now, there's only one thing left to do. One last step, which is what most people forget to do, is product registration. You can not only access warranty, but also earn ORS points to claim exclusive prices such as Steam codes and even ORS robots. If you register within 30 days, you will get an extended warranty. Product registration is quite easy. First, go to the ORS official website and sign up to become an ORS member. Select My Product and click Register Your Product. Key in the serial number and check number, which you can find on both the packaging and products that you bought. Upload a distinct invoice when you are done. Now that we've done the last step, our PC build is finally done. Enjoy it and thanks for watching.